presenting the effects of diet and lifestyle on uh, athletic performance and overall well-being. And uh, I'd like to start off kind of introducing my main points during this presentation. I have my introduction, my main question. Um, then we have just an overall overview of why I'm talking about this, which is related to technology and our new lifestyles, like in this modern era. Um, then we have three main points I'm going to be tackling, which are scheduling and sleep, like overall well-being when it goes to like managing your life, uh, regular exercise, so just having an active lifestyle, and then nutrition, uh, and then just the conclusion. Um, so my main question is, uh, does a ketogenic diet along with healthy lifestyle habits improve athletic performance or overall well-being? So, um, Basically, sometimes you can be stressed, right? Uh, no one likes being stressed, no one likes being unhappy. So, uh, I'm just going to tackle the main, the main things to kind of avoid, to, to, to have a long life, a long happy life, and just feel good with yourself, whether it's mentally or physically. And uh, stress can be of two sources, avoidable and unavoidable. Uh, avoidable can be like going to, to, to a stressful job or smoking, uh, a bad diet, all of these things, and uh, unavoidable can be accidents, deaths, just some things that are inevitable, inevitable in life and that you have to battle with anyways. Um, but yeah, in this modern era, uh, technology makes it really hard for us to stay in the present moment, live in now, and take a moment to breathe, take a moment to kind of appreciate nature or just connect to our roots because basically we're humans we're not that we're not that different from monkeys I'm not saying that we should turn back into Neanderthals or cavemen but uh, we should definitely take a few steps back once in a while and uh, yeah technology blue light uh, for example just disrupting our circadian rhythms with blue light before going to bed that's that's one example of things that kind of uh, mess up our our uh, our bodies, uh, those are things we can avoid. And the next few things I'm going to talk about are exactly that, how to go back. Uh, yeah, stress usually creates a fl fight or flight response in us. So for example, right now I'm presenting, I'm kind of anxious, so my heart rate is up, uh, I'm alert, my, my breathing is maybe a little bit shallow. Those are things that sometimes uh, our bodies make us do to try and survive. I'm not, I'm not running away from lying or anything right now, but sometimes our bodies mistake fake stress for something that's an actual threat. So that's something to really avoid. Um, so yeah, uh, this, this process disrupts many parts of our normal body functioning, digestion, uh, normal heart functioning, and immune, immune functions. So people who are constant, constantly stressed are going to have uh, definitely problems in their everyday life, like uh, more diseases, just feel generally unhappy and things like that, or even just any type of illness basically. Um, and then obviously when you're happy, you're less stressed, and when you're less stressed, that usually means you're, you're more happy. So it's a pretty much bi-directional uh, formula right there. and. Um, Happiness obviously can't treat disease. It can't. It can't stop any of these things from happening. But it's definitely a good preventive measure for some things that could happen to us if we weren't, uh, if we were stressed out. So yeah, uh, things that can definitely help us with being more happy or relaxed are meditation, breathing techniques, uh, and then my three main points for this presentation, which are regular exercise, good sleep, and nutrition. So, uh, sleeping is a really, really important part in our daily life. I struggle with that once in a while, so uh, I, I'm kind of a hypocrite. We all are, but this is a journey that we're, we're trying to all uh, get through. Uh, but yeah, sleeping is very important because it's the processing of all information during the day, the sorting of information, just new stuff, and even just repairing our body, repairing our minds. So if we if we sleep less, uh, that's definitely going to put a lot of stress on our bodies, on our brains, and even maybe uh, 
do some permanent damage to our brains, for example, that could uh, reduce our prefrontal cortex, which is a frontal part of our brain, which is responsible for language, creativity, and just, uh, it, it's part of our brain. Our brain is important, so we just need to take care of it. Uh, and then one really important part about being happy is setting goals, because without goals, what are we here for, right? We all have big goals, small goals in life, but the important thing is to know how to get to these goals. So just small steps, one step at a time, they need to be attainable, measurable, so you know when you get to them, and especially, uh, we need to reward them, and they need to be rewarding. So goals for ourselves that we feel content with once we achieve, and uh, that we reward once we get to them. For example, one study uh, conducted on um, kindergartens, I believe, was uh, they, they were supposed to do one certain task, and some of them were rewarded independently from this task and their performance in this task, and some of them were rewarded if they did well in this task. And those rewarded on their uh, performance did better in this task because they were more motivated, right? That makes sense. Um, now to exercise. Uh, we have two main types of, I guess, we can divide populations into two different groups, sedentary and active. Sedentary is just people who don't exercise on a daily or weekly basis, just not very often. Sit down a lot, uh, lie down a lot, um, and this can usually lead to health complications like uh, a higher BMI, uh, hypertension, higher mortality rates, cardiovascular uh, uh, diseases, and um, metabolic syndrome, which is basically type 2 diabetes and uh, and yeah, cardiovascular disease. An active lifestyle, on the other hand, is just incorporating exercise into daily lives, whether that's walking to a grocery store, riding your bike to work, all of these important things that our bodies are supposed to do and are designed to do to work well uh, are really important for us. And yeah, these are usually connected to a lower BMI, uh, longer life, uh, long longevity, and we have um, also just yeah, more life, so lower mortality rates, less chance of cardiovascular disease, all these things that we do not want. Um, so yeah, exercise is important throughout all our lives. We're never too old to do anything, right? It's not an excuse. Maybe if you feel that you're too old to do something, then it means that you're giving yourself, well, you're not giving yourself an excuse, but maybe... Uh, okay, I forgot. Whatever. Uh, but yeah, doing especially aerobic exercise until uh, a very prolonged age, let's say, to, as long as you can, is going to be very, very important to uh, keep yourself healthy because exercise is going to make your metabolism and immune system more efficient. Your heart is going to be more efficient. Um, also, we have um, preservation of neuromuscular uh, muscular junctions, motor units, mitochondria, and just, think, just keep a uh, high density of capillaries. There are just tons of things that, that are maintained in your body, as, as, a, as well as muscle mass. Or um, Another really important thing is proteostasis, which is the stability of proteins in your body, which means that uh, that's a really decreased risk of cancer if, uh, if you keep this under control, which you all want because you don't, no one wants to be in a wheelchair when they grow. Well, not when they grow up. I'm already a grown up because I'm 18, basically. But, uh, yeah, we don't want that. Um, now to nutrition. Nutrition is a really important part of our lives because it's, it's what fuels us, right? We, we need nutri nutrients, we need calories, we need all this to get through our daily lives. So we need to keep it clean and rich. So what do I mean by that? I mean unprocessed foods, simple ingredients, and really just bare, bare foods without, without any fillers, without any food coloring, no preservatives, because our body doesn't need that. Those aren't natural things, and anything that isn't natural usually is bad for us, actually, as, as well as uh, fats. And so here, here you can see a, uh, a typical food pyramid. At the bottom we have vegetables, uh, whole grains, and healthy oils like olive oil or other seed oils. And then we have proteins, so we have fish, chicken, uh, those are lean meats. We have nuts, and above that, 
uh, we have cheese and uh, white white uh, sugars and uh, fatty meats, which are things that we should eat less because they have the top of the pyramid. Uh, yep, and then one one particular diet that I want to focus on is the Mediterranean diet because this is the the cleanest one. Let's say one of the most popular ones, also that I am familiar with because I lived in France and Italy. Uh, it's simple ingredients from the land, and generally, um, yeah, extremely simple. And with this diet, you can have uh, definitely lower inflammatory responses, uh, less inflammation, decreased uh, quantity of cancer-promoting hormones, which is really good. It, it helps um, gut microbiota, so that, that makes you digest a lot better. Uh, and yeah, life expectancy, all those things put together always help you live long. Uh, and yeah, that's basically where it's, that's the map of where it's located, where most people have that diet. Then we have uh, athlete sites. Most of us, a few of us in here are just, just trained right now. Some of us may have worked out today. I saw Matt on a walk earlier. Uh, and if we do a lot of exercise every day, or even just a few walks, it's really important to get us extra stuff to keep our body going. Because we're not just, if you're sitting on a couch, your body's not going to need as much. But uh, as athletes, or even as active people, we're going to need proteins, uh, a lot more water, and a lot of things that are going to help us recover and uh, repair the things that maybe happen to us while we're active. Um, and then in, in one study, nutrition and sports performance, researchers found that we need a lot of protein as athletes. And uh, yeah, anything to keep up with our phys physiological and psychological stress that is, that is induced by training. So uh, that means large amounts of carbohydrates, especially uh, for, for uh, endurance athletes before competitions. So whole grains, uh, lots of protein. For, for repairing all the damage we do once in a while. And uh, lots of water, minerals, because we lose a lot of that while sweating. And iron, especially for endurance athletes, teens, and female athletes, because of menstruation. So yeah, hydration and protein, those are the main important things. And in the, in the sports area, one diet that is, even, even with, uh, for example, people with autism or people struggling with diabetes, ketogenic diets are very popular, although it's quite controversial, because basically it takes a lot of time for our body to adapt from fat to carbohydrate, I mean carbohydrate to fat use, because it's basically, um, it's called ketogenic because you use ketones in your body, because if you don't use uh, carbohydrates as energy, ketones are produced, which are the main food for our brains, so we're going to have uh, increased brain activity. Um, we're going to have less oxidative stress because basically sugars are a quick source of energy. Uh, back to Neanderthals, talking about us being monkeys basically, they don't, they, we don't really need that much sugars. It's not very often that a caveman would find fruit on a tree. If they did, it was spring or summer and they would eat tons for a bit and then go back to eating roots for a few weeks. Roots or meat or fiber, protein, fat-rich foods. So it's very important to keep our carbohydrates low sometimes, and especially keep them whole, because uh, simple carbs are the faster ones that create a lot more stress in our bodies. And yeah, one study by Ken's was um, basically analyzing what effects this ketogenic diet, or even just a reduced carbohydrate diet had on athletes. And it was, uh, first of all, decreased fat body mass, which uh, was the first notable effect of this diet, since uh, the body got used to burning fat more than carbohydrates, so they use those reserves that you have on your body, and uh, which usually meant an increased athletic performance if you lost a teeny bit of weight, but there was no significant decrease in athletic performance. Uh, people found that uh, even just reducing carbohydrates a bit was still doable. It's a still pal palatable diet. And um, yeah, although, although there weren't really any significant gains in athletic performance, 
in most of the studies that I found. Uh, this, this adaptation that your body makes takes a really long time, so most of the studies acknowledged that their study time wasn't long enough to kind of notice the long-term effects. But yeah, that's basically it for nutrition. And uh, that picture is what a ketogenic diet looks like. You don't have many grains in there. It's basically meat, uh, dairy products, and vegetables. That's pretty much it. All you need. Oh, I, didn't, I thought I deleted this so well. But, uh, I didn't finish this slide, but my mentor was uh, Mike Levangi, my cross-country co cross coach. And uh, he helped me a lot with understanding um, diets, how to create them, how to make workout plans, just understanding the basics of all I needed to do this project. Uh, what else did I do with him? Um, I read a book that he gave to us for the cross-country season, which focused a lot on sleep, on nutrition, and all these things put together, and correct training plans. And yeah, that's basically it, uh, what I did with him. Uh, as a conclusion, uh, I wanted to focus on an athlete that uh, my father was in contact with when he was working for uh, an Italian brand, Federico Pellegrino. He's, a, he's an elite cross-country skier and uh, won a silver medal, at, silver medal at the Beijing Olympics. And what stood out for me about this athlete was that he focused a lot on sleep and nutrition. Uh, he said that as soon as he focused on these two things, he felt like he really boosted his performance and got that edge on his competition. And, I mean, as athletes, or even as normal people, just focusing on these things, whether it's nutrition and sleep, uh, being less stressed out, relaxed, uh, these things can really help us either get us an edge on our competition, uh, because there are some pretty good athletes out there, but maybe they're sleep deprived. If we sleep more than some really good athletes, we could definitely get better than them. But, um, yeah, he focused a lot on these things, and that's what helped him out. For example, uh, he told my dad once that before races, he would basically just sleep, and that and that made him feel a lot better. Or, uh, yeah, those were really important things. But one other thing that he really focused on was listening to his body, which I think a lot of us need to do a little bit more. Uh, whether we're trying to do these new things or not, uh, following or just listening to our body could help us a lot. And. Uh, whether we decide to go on this small journey of taking little steps at a time to improve ourselves or not, there's definitely people out there willing to help us. And I think we can all take little steps to make ourselves feel better tomorrow. So, yeah, that was it. Thank you for coming. Any questions? I was curious about the ketogenic diet, <clears throat> um, it, especially since you mentioned that there's not a lot of data in support, but it's really mm. giving athletes an edge. So I guess I'm just curious about what drew your attention to that over, say, the Mediterranean diet, Mediterranean diet or hand in hand with it. Why well, focus more on research for that one? Yeah. yeah. I guess it's kind of the curiosity I had for it, since yeah. it was kind of controversial and not much research there and I kind of wanted to experiment with it too like decreasing carbs and I, I just feel like the general benefits from that uh, were pretty attractive so I wanted to dive into it a little bit more and see what, uh, what would change on an athlete's perspective and I didn't find much but I think that it does uh, change something and especially because the studies don't usually last that long especially because you have to pay the people you're, you're doing the study on but, uh, yeah, it does change something. Yeah, thank you. I have a comment. Yeah? Um, could you go back to your first slide with your essential question? Of course. <coughs> yeah, so I wanted to point out, I love how you put, you added well-being into mm -hmm. this. And I think you tied it really together with your conclusion. Sometimes the narrative is, is very much focused on like the performance, right? And like you could have sat here or I could have sat here and listened to you like talk about running for thirty minutes, but I'm so so glad 
that you included this topic on well-being, listening to your body, and that was really important. So good on you for that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing not everyone in here are runners. So I just wanted to focus on everything because just it's the performance of living, right? For me. That's what I was focusing on. Did you find uh, anything in particular with Mike that stood out to you? You know, as far as life, you know, real life experience as a coach and a runner in terms of, you know, advice or information? Anything new that he gave me that I found particularly useful? Yeah. Um, I'd say definitely focusing on eating and sleeping. I mean, I already kind of knew that, but he was really, really good at reinforcing that whenever we had a, a strenuous workout or he could, I know one quote he uses a lot is, eat a lot, any food is good food, or in doubt, eat more, or something like that. Uh, those, are, those are things that he, that he says a lot, which I found pretty useful to my personal growth once in a while. I guess that's it. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for the audience. <laughs> Oh. Is Dominique around? Um, she's probably floating in between the different classes. Oh, she's oh. Back up yeah. Mm -hmm. Stuart's coming up. He'll be right here and he's coming up the elevator right now. Um. Right now? Yeah, you're in the other room. Right now. They said six o'clock. Yeah. What? No, they have to wait until six. I'm going to go talk to them. Yeah, because we're watching. You've got to see both of them. Are you allowed to go get my hug? I don't know. I 
Would you say that was from like a three inch? I didn't know you were a guy who was. It took longer. Ha, it took longer. of my mom and dad's adventures on the uh, Appalachian Long Trail and uh, I've always loved doing uh, hikes and campouts um, by myself and I think that uh, doing a long distance hike is the ultimate combination of you know everything that I love to do and uh, I think you know I wondered how I might prepare for a long distance hike such as the uh, Appalachian Trail. Um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, some you know things that you might need uh, for a long distance hike, such as mental fortitude, um, you know, physical health, uh, nutrition and hydration, uh, finances and logistics, and the importance of reliable equipment. Um, for mental health and uh, physical health, it, it, it's really important to have a positive outlook when you're, uh, when you're hiking. It can be pretty daunting sometimes when you're, you know, staring up that mountain or whatever and you think maybe, uh, you know, I can't make it. It's, it's too far if you think about the whole trail as a whole instead of, you know, a series of uh, shorter hikes. It can be a little daunting. But it's important to, you know, keep one foot in front of the other and just keep on moving and keep on keeping on uh, without doubting yourself. That can be the number one thing that can take you out before you've even started. Um, and it really puts into perspective what you need to survive, you know, uh, food, water, and shelter. And that's pretty much it. Um, and for physical health, it's, an, it's important to, you know, uh, be healthy on the trail, obviously, um, by bringing a, a med kit and a toothbrush, uh, two very important things. Um, you definitely want to bring a toothbrush, I've heard uh, some stories of people, you know, just bringing peanut butter on the trail or something, and uh, they ended up having lots of cavities by the end of it. Um, so definitely some of those creature comforts can definitely help you along the way. And uh, bringing a fully stocked med kit is definitely important if you, you know, take a fall or if you get a cut or something like that. It's also important to be able to identify poisonous snakes and plants um, because on the trail you might run into, you know, some snakes or maybe poison ivy or something like that. And you definitely want to know what those look like so you can avoid them uh, before it's too late. Um, for health and nutrition, um, Really, hydration is, is really, really, really important. Uh, one of the most important things on the trail. Um, you know, it's a really good idea to bring a water filter or iodine tablets. Uh, sometimes you don't want to wait for your little drip filter to work, and you'll be sitting there forever trying to get a drink of water. So, iodine tablets are a really good option to bring. Uh, but they also, you know, taste really, really nasty. So, I would definitely bring some flavored drink packets or something with you uh, to kind of cover up that because it can definitely be pretty gross. Um, there are lots of good uh, options for trail food nowadays. Uh, you could dehydrate your own food uh, and ship that to yourself. My mentor actually did this um, when she was hiking the trail. Uh, she brought an algae bottle with her and you know dehydrated some stews and stuff and then just put that in an algae bottle and let it rehydrate while she's hiking and by the time you get to where you need to go, it's uh, all set and ready to go. Um, but there are also uh, lots of other options for trail food and uh, stuff that you can bring 
well, hiking. Uh, Mountain House Meal makes uh, some dehydrated foods, and uh, they're very, very nice as well. Um, pretty quick and easy. Uh, I personally like uh, MREs. Uh, it's got pretty much everything you need for a full day. Um, I know people in the military expend a lot of energy while they're hiking around, uh, you know, similarly weighted, even heavier packs um, while they're on trekking. So uh, something like that could be very, very useful while you're hiking. Uh, on average, the adult male needs about 2,400 to 3,200 calories, uh, but this can kind of depend on the person. Uh, everybody's different. You really need to figure out what works for you, you know. Uh, some people might need a little bit more, and some people might need a little bit less, but it, it all depends on the person and uh, who you are and what you need. Um, for finances and logistics, uh, you definitely want to figure this out before you start hiking, because it can be uh, pretty terrible when you're on the trail worrying about money. Uh, I wouldn't want to do that, I know that for a fact, so I would want to you know, save up and do all things with money that I needed to do before I started hiking, because... I know that that could be a real drag if you're thinking about money the entire time uh, while you're hiking along. So, you know, you want to budget for your trip, you know, uh, and uh, figure out things like uh, if I'm going to be sending myself food, um, how am I going to do that? And uh, how far would I need to hike in a day to be able to reach uh, my uh, next, you know, food, cash, whatever, <laughs> uh, the next spot where I'm sending myself food. Um, you know, and it, another thing you got to think about is, like, say for the Appalachian Trail, if you're going to start in Georgia, you got to pay for a flight to get down there, or you got to drive down there or something. Um, so you would have to buy a ticket and possibly stay a night in a hotel or something like that. Um, and obviously, uh, the, the gear can be quite expensive, uh, although I think some people have a misconception about, you know, very expensive gear being the best, and this is not always the case really got to field test your equipment and uh, make sure it's reliable. Um, for the importance of reliable equipment, um, the most important piece of equipment to me is, is footwear and clothing. Uh, if your feet fail you while well, you're on the trail, that can be really devastating to a hike and it can take you out much before you know, you're ready. So you definitely want a nice comfortable pair of boots, uh, even bring some moleskin just in case. Um, this can be really, really important, um, you know, and, and clothing. You want some waterproof clothing. It can be really, really rainy. I know uh, my mom told me a story about a uh, person that she hiked with, and um, it was raining for like a couple, three or four days or whatever, and uh, my mom turns to her and she's like, could it rain any harder? And then at that moment, it just started downpouring, and uh, she got overwhelmed, and she ended up uh, taking herself out of the hike at that point. Uh, so you want to be prepared for, for stuff like that. And it can be a real bummer when, uh, when a piece of gear or something uh, fails you while you're on the hike. And on the subject of you know, reliable gear, I decided to bring in my backpack here to show you something that you, know, you might bring uh, while hiking on the Appalachian Trail or, or any other long distance trail. Um, the most important thing, in my opinion, is your med kit. Um, besides like your footwear and your clothing and all that. Um, if you take a fall or if you scratch yourself, you really want to take care of that. You don't want any dirt getting in there or anything, getting infected or anything. I personally have a sewing kit in here as well. Uh, so if I get a really deep gash or something like that, I can take care of that and uh, get to where I need to go or get to some place where I can get better professional help uh, with something like that. Um, I also uh, bring a folding solar panel. Um, it's not good to rely on like a cell phone or something like that because you know you're not always going to have a sunny day where you'll be able to charge your phone or, or do something like that but uh, uh, if you're going to I would bring something like this uh, you know you might get a good 10% by the end of the day <laughs> you can make a phone call or something or check in or you know do something like that so I'd definitely bring something like this on the off chance that your phone is, is you know going to fail you um, what you really want to bring is a, is a compass and a map. That can be super, super, super important, especially if you get lost. I've heard of a couple of cases where people were, you know, decided that they were going to camp out off the trail like 400 feet or so, and uh, they ended up getting lost by the morning, you know. Um, 
because the woods can look a lot different from nighttime to daytime, and it, it can be a little, a little scary in that department. Um, another thing is uh, bug spray. This is super strong bug spray. Uh, you can spray this on your hat or your foot cuffs or whatever. Uh, but definitely bring something like this. Bugs can be horrible and very, very annoying. So I would definitely bring some bug spray with you. Let me go. Flashlights. Uh, you definitely want to bring some flashlights where you're going. Uh, if you don't make it to where you need to be um, by, you know, nighttime, you don't want to be stuck in the dark. So definitely bring, you know, a couple flashlights, a couple reliable ones. You don't want them to break or anything. So, you know, test your equipment. Again, it's very, very important. Um, also, you know, a knife is very important. You might need a knife for any number of things, you know, cutting gauze to the right size or something like that. Uh, a knife can be very important, but more than a knife is uh, like a multi-tool. I've done some improvising before, um, especially when we get into my mess kit here, um, with, you know, little things breaking. Maybe you need a pair of pliers or something to get that, you know, better. And uh, so I would definitely bring something like this if you're going out on a trail, especially a long distance trail. Um, I also like to bring some, some dry tinder with me. Um, I know that if you're, especially if you're cooking over, you know, fire, and that's going to be your cooking source, well, you're on a trail or something like this, this can be super, super important. Uh, especially when everything's wet and you just want to eat and you just want to, you know, do this. So it can be very annoying with wet, wet wood and trying to get that going for hours. But something like this will give you a good head start. Comparison. Also, uh, tent spikes. Uh, if you're bringing a tarp or a tent, you don't want that blowing away on you. So definitely bring some tent spikes with you. You know, keep that secure and weighed down. On the subject of cooking as well, um, I have a few different options here um, for meals and, and cooking ways that you can use on the trail. Um, this right here is a uh, a whisper light stove. It can use multiple different fuel uh, types. Um, it can be really annoying, say, if you bring just a propane stove or something and you can't find a f that fuel type in that one town that you stopped in. That can be super, super annoying and can put a, a drag on what you're doing. So definitely not only bring, you know, I would, I would bring something like this over just a, a regular propane little folding camping stove. Um, and Along with that, you know, how are you going to clean your, your mess kit and whatnot? Uh, this is a super concentrated uh, biodegradable soap. You can use this for a number of things. Um, you can use it as body wash and shampoo, clothing detergent, and, uh, you know, obviously cleaning your mess kits and whatnot. This is one fuel type you might use. This is just a you know, butane propane mix for your basic soaps so like this. this um, Whisper Light can also take this type of fuel, but it also has a, uh, a fuel bottle that you can use a number of different fuel types for. Uh, so definitely think about buying something like this over something like this. It can definitely save you while you're on the trail. I know from experience, wind can be one of your greatest issues while cooking. Um, so if I can get this out, you definitely want to bring just a cheap little windscreen with you. It can be really, really annoying if you're trying to get a fire going or, you know, if you're cooking on your little propane stove and it's constantly blowing all of your heat away from, you know, what you're trying to cook. So definitely think about bringing something like this. Um, on the subject of uh, using my Leatherman to, you know, improvise, I actually was trying to cook over a wood fire one day and this used to have a little plastic tab on it. And I went to go grab the lid off of my little pot and it melted right to me. So you definitely, you know, want to have a little bit of wire or something with you, you know, something to fix uh, some things while you're going along. I did this a while ago. It's still sturdy. still works pretty good. So definitely want to think about, you know, if something were to break, how are you going to get past that? Um, I personally like to be super comfortable, especially when I'm sleeping. 
after a long day of hiking. Um, I don't want to, you know, feel roots in my back or anything. So I actually bring two sleeping pads. Um, you know, this is your basic, you know, foam one, Thermarest. Uh, you know, these are really nice. But I, other than that, I bring a, a nice blow-up one. This one's like two inches and two inches thick, and it's really, really nice. And you won't feel any roots in your back or anything like that. It's super, super comfortable. Um, yeah, but some of those creature comforts can definitely make the difference while you're, you know, on a long distance trail. You definitely want to think about, you know, that type of thing. Um, I personally uh, maybe wouldn't bring a tent because those are really heavy. Um, I personally would bring something like this, a hammock. Uh, I would think about getting a hammock with a bug net. Again, bugs can be super, super annoying, especially when you're trying to get a, a good night's rest and things are just biting your arms and your face all the time. So definitely think about, you know, getting something like this uh, with you. I also have a rope in here. You want to think about how you're going to string that thing up. So definitely bring some rope. And rope in general. I actually have two things of rope in here because you can never have enough rope in my opinion. You know, if you got to string up your food from wildlife, you want to keep it away from bears and skunks and even porcupines and things like that. I, I know a couple stories of um, my mom actually when she was hiking the long trail. Uh, this porcupine, she woke up to this porcupine trying to get into her pack and she needed to beat it off with a broom because um, <laughs> it was just trying to get at her food. And I know that uh, my dad has made his first encounter with a, with a skunk when he first came here from England. He didn't know what a skunk was. No. Well, I mean, I'm shy to the concept. <laughs> didn't know what it was. <laughs> um, you definitely want to bring a uh, good warm sleeping bag with you. You know, it can get pretty cold in the mountains, and uh, a lot of these long-distance hiking trails are in the mountains, so you definitely want to think about that. And, uh, you know, if you're hiking a little too fast for, you know, where you're going, and you don't time it right, you might get into some pretty cold weather. So I would think about bringing a sleeping bag uh, that's warm enough to, to combat all of that. Um, you know, you can always unzip your sleeping bag, you know, halfway, and let some heat out, but you can't, you know, get more heat into it. Um, so definitely bring a, a nice warm sleeping bag. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it for my for my gear and everything. Um, thank you all for coming and listening to my presentation. Um, is there any questions? How heavy is your full pack? Have you ever weighed it? Uh, I think it's around 45 pounds probably. This is not necessarily what I would bring as well. This is a little bit overkill. Um, but I wanted to show you guys, you know, some, some multiple options uh, that you might bring with you. No? Do you have a brand of like shoes or clothes that have always done you good that you would recommend? Um, I personally recommend uh, Keen hiking boots. I think they last uh, the longest in my opinion. I've had a lot of different pairs of hiking boots. Uh, Morales, um, Vescue I think is, is the other brand and Keen's have definitely lasted me the longest. I'm pretty hard on shoes, so I think those can definitely be yeah, a good option for, for most people. But again, it, it all depends on you and what you find the most comfortable. You know, if, if your keens aren't very comfortable, and you know, that's definitely the top priority, um, you definitely want comfortable feet along the way. Any more questions? How much food would you set up for a food drop? For a food drop? What kind of food would you set up for a food drop? Um, I would bring uh, MREs. It's pretty much everything you need in here. It's also got a Tootsie Roll. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, definitely want to. Uh, I, I just like these, especially because uh, I wouldn't need to bring a stove. It's got a heating element right in there, so uh, you just add a little bit of water, just a, like a tablespoon or so, and it, and it heats it heats itself. Um, and it comes in a its own trash bag, so you know it's easy to fold up and put it away. And there's no you know, hard tins or anything. So this could definitely be a good option. But I also I also really like these uh, mountain house meals as well. Any more questions? Ms. Reed? Yeah, so uh, one of the fun things about long distance hiking, I think, are the trail names that come up for people. So I'm wondering if your mentor or um, your parents who've hiked long, did they have trail names that they shared with you? 
Uh, I forgot my mentor's trail name. What was your guess? Trail name? Oh, this was probably Jennifer Rabbit. Je oh, Jennifer Rabbit was yeah, your trail name. Probably. What was your trail name? Well, there's two of us, so we were the English muffins. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Uh, no, we were the Brits. We initially we were the English muffins, then we were the Brits. Yeah, had to change it. It was too we embarrassing. Had to change it. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Someone? I'll keep it easy. I just have a comment. Mm. I've seen a lot of capstone presentations, um, and yours is by far like the most informative I've ever. <laughs> What's the longest hike you've had a chance to do? Um, I actually haven't done uh, any like super long distance hikes. I mean, I've done you know day hikes where I've brought in you know a similar weighted pack and and went and hiked. But I really do want to do a long distance hike. I, I would really love to do that. I just haven't had you know the time. But now getting out of school, I'm uh, looking forward to doing a lot of hiking throughout the years. What about ticks? <laughs> yeah, that's where the, the bug spray comes in. Uh, okay, that's right. Definitely want bug spray with you, especially for ticks. Ticks are nasty. Everybody can agree on that. Uh, they're horrible. So definitely bring you know good potent bug spray and a tick key and a tick remover with you because you definitely don't want Lyme disease. And check yourself for ticks as well. That. What about fishing rod? Would you would you recommend taking one of those little collapsible fishing rods with you? It would be fun, but I think um, you know a lot of people might bring some things like that and then never end up using them because they're really tired at the end of the day. You know, hiking 15 miles can be exhausting. So, you know, like your books that you never read. <laughs> you probably don't. <laughs> Box set. <laughs> What about safety on the trail, your personal safety, as far as interactions with other people? Uh, there, yeah, there can definitely be some sketchy people uh, out on the trail that aren't even hiking. Uh, just uh, go up there and you know do whatever. Uh, so it's good to keep away from people and definitely bring a buddy is one of the most important things. The buddy system definitely works. Any more questions? We'll give them a round of applause. Thank you all. How do I cancel this? I don't know how. Uh, escape. You know, we are going to have one more. Uh, and so maybe we'll leave Dominique's computer set up and we can go in and pull the next one up. So I think you're good there. Okay. Yeah. That'll save me having to figure out how to do all right, I'll be in the next room down there. So I'll see you there. Yeah. We should get a chair. I, should park, park yep. I don't want to stand up like Nick. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.
I'm trying to bring my old books from the Appalachian Trail. Yeah. Yeah. Maps and that part. I can't find the maps. You couldn't find the maps? I, don't, I didn't yeah. know where they were. I found like, the guidebooks, but that was it. I didn't find the maps. Yeah. Yeah. The maps are yeah. the yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I just saw the guidebooks and I was like, man, yeah. we'll, we'll keep those at home. Well, having done many of these, this particular subject. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. And thank you for coming. Yeah. I was talking to Ruth and Charlie a little bit about family dynamics on the street. Yeah, that's <laughs> so I was trying to envision doing that Alex in my store, poor family. It's not necessarily not. I know, they're like, oh, we made it. Definitely a strategy. Like, oh, spreading out during the day. Yeah. 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 yeah, it was actually, uh, it was very much up in the air, like, oh, boy, this is great. But very quickly, Joe and I will speed and the first time change oh yeah per mile it's is, just up and down, down, down. down yeah. it's just the, the grade is more significant yeah the Appalachian Trail is more difficult than most of the other long distance trails yeah because of the same reason mm -hmm. it, it's smaller mountains but steeper grades yeah versus in the west. south too there's lots of switchbacks and then as you go north yeah. it goes straight up yeah. the mountain yeah. which can definitely be different yeah, yeah. heard a lot of that <laughs> yeah, yeah that's definitely a, a wrapping factor so yeah Nice job. Have a good Feel one. good? Yes. A little weight off your shoulders? A little bit, yeah. Well, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for listening to it. Yeah. So this determines whether they graduate. This is a piece of it. It's one part of your graduation. Yeah, yeah, in Capstone. Might switch schools. Oh. <laughs> Most schools um, have it. Ethan, I don't know if you want that call. Up it's not your own, it's just like My old class. school was based on like your hours of community service. Oh, you had to have a certain amount of hours to graduate. I think it was like 50 something. Mm -hmm. uh, this is kind of similar. I'm just thinking about getting out of the hours of field work. Yeah. yeah. So should I just pull it up over here? Yeah, I can just put my own chair. Because it's sort of so I was wondering if maybe we should just I have no idea. It was like we could we could pull yours up here. Out of all of them. You can look at the floor. Yeah, could be more But I don't think it's you can if you can figure it out. I'm sorry, it's ready to go right now on here. That was before we got there. I think. Although it's not showing up. No, it's not. But it's a failure. I know why. 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 I services right now and why we need more. So I've been, my mentor for this project was my actual therapist 
and sometimes when I worked with him in my regular sessions, I would just ask him about his job and like job requirements, what it took to be, what he does, and even just how he does some of his everyday things, like how many people he works with, like how often he does. And then I also did research on it myself with various mental health like websites. So, COVID sucks and it affects a therapist job because when everybody is like, when everybody is having, so when everybody is struggling with a pandemic, it makes a therapist's job harder because everybody wants, everybody wants someone to talk to about this. And sometimes it's not always available because a therapist can, is also a human being that needs help sometimes, and so some of them would quit their job or do less hours to go talk to another therapist. So that leaves a very short window for people who need it too. And when, when a mental health person is, can't do, can't do their job or not enough, then it can also affect other, other jobs like the healthcare field. So research shows, I found this on many different websites, research shows that after the first surge of COVID-19 pandemic, 14% of nurses reported higher depression and 43% higher anxiety. So that's a problem and but when, it, when more therapists are leaving for their own mental health, who are they going to go to? So burnout. Burnout is kind of where I'm going with this. So burnout happens when someone at work has so much to do, deadlines, more work, just work-related stress in general, where they get exhausted and it's a stress-related thing and people want someone to talk to about stress. But any mental health job is, it's a job and burnout can happen to them too because so many people, so many people are coming to them for help, but they can only help so many people. So this is how the mental health, mental health department can affect other jobs. So let's say, so, so in this time, let's say there's someone at a hospital who is scheduled to do open heart surgery that day. Let's say the day before, his wife comes up to him and says, hey, I want a divorce. That guy the next day, that guy just probably, he probably does not want to do open heart surgery. And even if he does, when he's in that state of mind, he might not work his best. But once again, who is he going to go to? So right now, there is a huge shortage, and it takes it takes a while to become a therapist or any kind of mental health professional because you need to go to college for a lot of them. There is some of them could even take eight years to earn a bachelor's or a master's degree. The cost for them is also very very high because of the amount of schooling. So. Everybody's mental health is important, and we need more people in this field because we're struggling with something that's a worldwide thing. And when there aren't enough people to help out with that, with talking, you know, just being there, it's, it affects everybody. And when it affects everybody, then nothing good comes out of that. I'm done. <laughs> So, um, given the need for s many more therapists, is this something you are considering in your future? So, when I first chose this project, it was because my dream after school was to instantly go to school to become a therapist. Mm -hmm. But I'm a very I'm a very hyperactive person. I'm a very hyperactive mind, and my interests change a lot. 
So right now, it might come back, but right now that's not what I want to do after school. But it was such a big issue and it was still something that I was kind of interested in. So I thought, if I'm not actually going to do like this field of work, I could at least talk about it. What do you want to do? Right now, I... I want to become a travel nurse. That will probably not last very long. <laughs> That's what I got right now. Based on your research, um, what do you think could be done to attract more people into the mental health field? Um, higher pay. Higher pay. Higher pay. Um, more like. Like, like an office, you know, when every, if everybody has their own office. Like, some people do it from home, some people like doing that, but in somebody's household, that might not be the best place to do that. So if, if we could provide more, like, more private offices for that, that thing, that could, that could help more people. Did you come across any information about how the pandemic has changed um, 